Welcome to our electron line. Now let's say that we have a beam. The beam is continuing you know, in, the, in both directions. So let me go ahead and put some lines over here so we can imagine that this beam is continuing. And let's say we apply a force onto the beam at the top. Then we can imagine that if the beam is supported somewhere like this, that there'll be a shear force inside the beam to compensate for the force that's applied to the beam. If we now go ahead and take a very close look at a very small volume element where the right side of that volume element is completely in line with that region where I'm trying to calculate the shear stress on that beam, I can then go ahead and take that volume element and put it right over here. And this right here is where we have the shear stress in response to the force being applied to the top of the beam there. But now take a look at all the sides on that small little volume element. This is a small little dV. And so we can say here that there's the amount of shear stress on this very small side of that very small volume element. And let's call that tau yz because it's directed on the y side of the volume and it's pointed, I should say it's situated on the right side of the volume and it's pointing in the upward direction, the z direction. Since that volume element doesn't go anywhere, it's a static situation, there must be another shear force on the other side in the opposite direction of equal magnitude. Otherwise, that volume element would either rotate or would move up or down. So it must be, uh, it must be such that all the shear forces on the low volume element must be um, canceling one another out, that's a good way to say it, in such a way that we sum up all the force in the y direction, they should add up to zero. So we can see here that the TYZ, which is the shear, the shear stress multiplied by the area, which gives us the shear force on this side, must then be compensated for or opposed by the shear stress on the other side multiplied times the area, which is your shear, which gives you the shear force on the other side of the volume, and they cancel each other out in such a way that the sum of those forces add up to zero, which implies that the magnitude of the shear stress over here must equal the magnitude of the shear stress on the other side of that small little volume element. And of course, we can do the same on this side and on that side. In addition to that, there must not be any net moment, otherwise something would simply rotate around inside that, that material. So we can say that the moment about the x-axis must also be zero. So here we have a shear stress on this side, on the top side of the volume element, which would rotate this whole volume element about the x-axis. And this shear stress, which results in a shear force, would also rotate the volume element in this direction. Now notice that those are in opposite direction, and they should cancel each other out. Notice if we take the shear stress on the z side in the y direction, multiply that times the area, delta x times delta y, which is the area over which the shear stress applies, that will then be a shear force. And if we multiply that times the moment arm, delta z, we have a torque or a moment about the x-axis. Then we have the opposing moment, which is caused by this one right here, that, that is therefore in a counterclockwise direction, that's a plus moment. So we have the shear on the tyz side right here, multiply times the area of the side, and then multiply times the moment arm, delta x, and that gives you a moment in the opposite direction, and those two moments cancel each other out so that the sum of the two add up to zero. Therefore, we know that the shear stress of zy must equal the shear stress of yz. Now, if we take this equality and we add that to this equality, we then realize that because of that, all the shear forces, therefore all the shear stresses on the volume element all the way around must have an equal magnitude, and therefore we can say that the shear stress of zy equals the shear stress of yz from here, and then we can say that the shear stress of zy must equal the, the, the shear stress of zy on the opposite side of the volume element, and this must therefore equal this, they're all equal, you can simply say that on a very small volume element, all the shear stresses must be the same all the way around all the sides of the, of the volume element. And therefore, we can conclude that the shear stress must have equal magnitude and must exist at all opposite sides of a volume element. And that as a result of simply calculating the net 
forces in both directions in the, the moments about any of the axes along any of the sides of the cube, and therefore we can conclude that the stresses must all have the same magnitude and must be all, they must exist at all opposite sides of a volume element. And that's what we know now about the internal shear stresses of any material that undergoes an applied force and therefore has a resulting shear force opposing that. And that's how we know that.